Acts, the Apostle, the Book of Acts, in the New Testament, the 27th chapter. And for my seniors, I'm going to ask you not to stand, because I'm going to read this whole chapter, and I don't want nobody leg giving out. I know how my legs do. Boy, I cooked at that barbecue a couple of weeks ago, and I stood up the whole time. Man, but I got in my car. I had to sit in the driveway for 10 minutes before I could get out of my car because everything locked up on me. So if you, if you can't stand, I'm not going to be mad at you. The 27th chapter of Acts. When you get it, say amen. amen. When the time came, New Living Translation Version, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius a captain of the Imperial Regiment, Aristarchus, Aristarchus, I'm sorry, a Macedonian from Thessalonica was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Adramidium on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. The next day when we docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. Putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. So we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. Keeping to the open sea, we passed along the coast of Sicilia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the province of Lycia. Then there, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us aboard. We had several days of slow sailing, and after great difficulty, we finally neared Snidus. But the wind was against us. Somebody say, but the wind was against us. So we sailed across the Crete, across the Crete and along the sheltered coast of the island, came past the, the Cape of Salomon. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty and finally arrived at Fair Havens near the town of Lasea. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall. And Paul spoke to the ship's officer about it. Men, he said, I believe there's trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with, on, with only a southwest and northwest exposure. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up an anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors could not turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of the small island named Calda, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Syracuse off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and stars until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Paul finally called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this danger and loss, but take courage.
courage. Tell somebody, but take courage. Take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God, whom I belong, to whom I belong, and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God, it will be just as he said. We will be shipwrecked on an island. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the sea of Adria, the sailors sensed that land was near. They dropped a weight line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured it again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid that we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officers and the soldiers, you will all die unless the the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair on your head will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke it off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat. All 276 of us who were aboard, After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to the shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors and left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders and raised the foresail and headed towards the shore. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship stuck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure that they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. He ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. The others held on to planks and debris from the broken ship. So everyone escaped safely to the shore. I just want to talk just for a few minutes uh, because my body is doing things against me for a few minutes, living on broken pieces, living on broken pieces. This story uh, in the book of Acts is one recorded by Luke, the physician who had the opportunity to travel with the apostle Paul as the apostle here is a prisoner. This is not a luxury trip. This is not a cruise vacation. This is not a church sponsored cruise. This is his journey to be imprisoned at Rome. But we also need to understand that he was, not only was he a prisoner on his way to Rome, a prisoner of uh, uh, the demagogue uh, who was in charge of all the province, he was also a prisoner of God because he had been destined to go to Rome to testify about the goodness of the Lord. What does that mean for us today? There's some places and some situations that we're going to be in that look like our lives are in danger because we have been destined to go tell somebody about our God. 
Not everything in the Christian life is going to be easy. Not every situation is going to work out for our good. But just because it doesn't work for your good doesn't mean that God isn't working on your behalf. Sometimes we find ourselves in precarious situations like the Apostle Paul where ministry is required of us, where our faith needs to be seen by other people in the midst of our turmoil, in the midst of our trials and tribulations so that they can look at us and say, I know that they're hurting. I know that she's broke. I know he is going through some stuff, but something about him still stands Tall. How does he keep a smile on his face? How does she walk with her head held up high? Somebody needs to see you going through, but standing there in the midst of going through and recognizing that there's a God that is keeping you in the midst of your storm. Amen. Now, it ain't easy. Now, now I, I, I'll be honest. I, I get mad with the world sometimes and because I'm introverted and because I, I like to keep to myself, if it were up to me, I'd just stay in my house all the time. I'd never come outside and deal with people or deal with situations. But God said, it's not about you. What you're going through ought to be a testimony to somebody else. What you're dealing with ought to be what you use to lift yourself up out of your situation and say, look, I know that God is keeping me and it ain't myself because if it were left up to me, I would have been dead a long time ago. The apostle Paul was in prison on his way on a ship with some 200 other prisoners. That's where the 276 people came from. You had the soldiers, you had the people who were in charge, but some 200 prisoners were being transported to either be imprisoned or put to death. Uh -huh. oh, come on down. Could you imagine mm. being on a ship with a whole bunch of folks that you know are gonna die? And there's a pretty good chance you're going to die too. And in the midst of all of that, all you can think about is how good God is. Paul had been bitten by snakes and should have died. He can think about only how good God is. Paul had been shipwrecked a number of times and thought he was going to die. But all he could think about was how good God is. He had been attacked. He had been beaten. He had been misaccused. He had been drugged through the street and beaten so bad that they thought that he had died. And all he could think about was how good God is. All right, now. Some of us are on a storm boat right now. You're going through the currents and every time you think you won't make it, the wind blows you another direction. I dare you to just let go and let God blow you where he needs you to go. Because sometimes we're dropping anchor in the wrong place. And God isn't telling us to drop anchor. God is telling us to go with the wind. Because the wind is exactly who God is. If you want to know who God is and why God is the wind, the word Holy Spirit, spirit comes from the Greek word pneuma. Pneuma meaning pneumatic means it means to blow. The Holy Spirit is a wind. And when the winds of life are blowing us, sometimes it looks like it's the enemy's wind and we anchor down and we try to hold on to what God had, we thought God had given us in one place because we don't want to let go but what the wind is trying to do is get you to let go so it can blow you to something better than you had before Amen. 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 Paul told the men uh -huh. I don't think we should make this trip but the captain decided to do it anyway sometimes in this Christian journey, there'll be some things that happen in our lives, especially in the church. Everybody ain't gonna agree on everything. That's right, amen. Now, I look at all y'all and everybody got nice smiles and nice faces and pretty church outfits on and nice suits and, oh Lord, but let it be a Monday night at 7 p.m. at business meeting and, and something come up that you agree with and you don't, and you agree with and you don't, and you agree with and you don't. You can hear the whispers coming from the back of the room. You can see people hunching other people to try to get them to say what they scared to say. And you can see the disagreements and the ship is on its way somewhere and that everybody agrees that we're going in the right direction, but the Spirit of God says, let's go. Will we mess up sometimes? Yeah. Will we hit some rocks sometimes? Yeah. But the Apostle Paul had somewhere to be. And in the midst of two weeks of storms, in the midst of two weeks of trouble, in the weeks of months of dissension in the church, of 
breaking up and people going other directions and it seemed like we weren't going to make it, the Spirit of the Lord came to Paul and said this, you might be going through a storm right now, but you're going to get to your destination. I need you to go to Rome and I need you to testify my goodness. There will be some obstacles along the way. There will be some winds that blow in your life. There will be some trials. There will be some, some soldiers on the boat that say, we're going to escape and leave y'all to die by yourself. And even if some folks leave and it look like you ain't going to make it, you're still going to get to your destination. Ah, because everybody ain't supposed to be on the ship. That's something we need to understand here. There's some ships in our lives. There's some things we go through, and everybody that's in the boat with you right now ain't supposed to be on the boat. We need to figure out if we got the right people in the right places doing the right thing and then launch out even if it's just a handful of us, we're just going to go because we got the right folks on the right boat doing the right thing. And God says he's going to take us to our destination. The scripture says that after about two weeks, everybody got real nervous. They hadn't eaten for two weeks. Wow. They were scared and they hadn't eaten for two weeks. You ever been so upset that you just can't eat nothing? You don't want to see nobody. You don't want to do nothing. Your stomach is hurting. Your, your, your mind is upset for two weeks in a storm. We think we go through stuff, and we do. We, we have our issues. Some people have been sick unto death, and some people have gone through some problems in your life. But could you imagine being on a little boat for two weeks in a storm nonstop? There's some folk in here today was sick with cancer, was sick with different things, and you know exactly what it feels like to be on a boat for two weeks of your life. You just want to jump overboard and throw in the towel. You just wish a big fish would come up and eat everybody. Lord, take me now. But God says, I can't take you yet because I got somewhere for you to go. All right. All right. Two weeks they didn't eat. The apostle Paul said, look here. Y'all not doing yourselves no good. Sitting around here with sad faces, not eating. If we're going to die, we're going to die. But the Holy Ghost told me we're going to live. So since I'm going to live, I need a little food for my sustenance so that when I get where I'm going, I won't be too tired to lift up my hands and tell God thank you. Listen, while we're waiting for what God is getting ready to do, this is not an opportunity to put ashes and sackcloth and sit around sad and look at all mad. You ought to wash your face like the scripture says. Put on your good clothes, comb your hair, and walk around here like God has already put the screens on the wall. Walk around here like God has already filled the sanctuary. Eat of the goodness of the Lord because when we get there, we need to be energized to give God some praise. So the apostle took a loaf of bread and he broke off a piece. Somebody say a piece. Uh, see, there's a theme here. The apostle broke off just a piece and began to eat. Some of us tend to want to eat the whole loaf at one time. And if you've ever tried to put too much bread in your mouth, especially white bread, because you know white bread will stick to the roof of your mouth and stick in your teeth and uh, get all messed up. You can't eat the whole loaf at once. Sometimes you just got to break off a little piece yeah. and a little bit at a time, God will begin to remind you by the pieces, yeah, I still got you. Yeah, I'm still with you. Yeah, I'll never leave you. Yeah, I won't forsake you. Because sometimes we can't take all of God's goodness at once. I don't know about you. God is just so good. I don't need him to give me everything at once. God, just, just give it to me little bit by little bit. Just break me off peace by peace, God. Because you're so good. If you give me all of it at once, God, I, I know I won't be able to take it. God, because there's nobody like you, God. Just break me off of peace. And I've been living on these broken pieces. I've been living on these broken pieces. The little bit that God gives me. Because here's the thing. I am not spiritually mature enough to receive the fullness of God's glory. If God showed his face, I'd have to hide. Because it's just too good 
to look at because I have not yet received my new body that he's going to give to me while I'll be able to enter into the fullness of his glory. So right now, God, just break me up a piece of heaven and I'll just say thank you. I'm living on pieces of my faith because sometimes my faith breaks down. Sometimes I want to give up. Sometimes it looks like I'm not going to make it and, and, and God will give me just enough energy to survive on the little piece of my faith. The scripture says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed that you can move mountains. But can you imagine after the mustard seed grows into a mustard tree if that seed could move mountains what can that tree do? We got a whole bunch of seeds in this church and I'm just waiting for them to grow. I'm just waiting for God to mature us. I'm just waiting for God to take the many pieces and put it together as one because when he does what he's getting ready to do, we won't be able to stand his goodness. I'm living on broken pieces of hope because sometimes we'll see good things happening and we'll be encouraged and things can be going well for weeks and then the slightest little thing can happen and one person one attitude one comment will throw you way off of your game you will forget about all the hope that you had for three and four weeks at a time and one little thing will throw you all the way off because we're living on pieces of hope because our hope has not yet matured to be what God has for us It has not matured for us to be able to look beyond those little things because sometimes, even when I I ignore the stuff, Luther, you know how it is. You ignore it, but in your mind, oh, you feel like, what's my man? I want to just bang, zoom, till he wants to just turn the moon, Alice. You just want to get so upset. But listen, when you hold on to your pieces of hope, God is able to string those experiences together. That's why we talk about in experiencing God and we may not have gotten there in the lesson yet but when we do we're going to get to this thing they talk about spiritual markers pieces of our spiritual journey and the point of spiritual markers is to remind you where you have been just in case you get off the course that God has for you if you get too far down the line and can't remember where you're going just go back to where you were last when you heard from him God I can't hear from you over here well go back to the last place you heard my voice and talk to me right there because the problem is you moved on to another boat you moved on to another ship you've gone on another direction and I'm standing right here waiting for you to piece together the crumbs that you laid down that I showed you before get yourself back to me all right now amen two weeks they hadn't eaten Paul took some bread and gave thanks broke off a piece and he ate it and everyone was encouraged and began to eat All, Luke says, 276 of us who were aboard, after eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. And when morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and they wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. Need to stop right there. Because the apostle had already told them that we will be shipwrecked on an island. God had already given the instruction. God had already told them what to do. But somehow in their feeble minds, they came up with an idea that sounded like God's and thought that that was the best thing for them to do. How many times have we done that? God has given us some instruction and then we get it in our mind. Oh, I think I know what I should do. No, just do what God said to do. But God said we're going to be shipwrecked. I think we should run ourselves into these rocks. No, run into the island because God said to go to the island. But I just want to do it right here, God. No, do what God says to do. I don't care if you don't understand it. I don't care if it's confusing to you. I don't care how many people vote against it. Do what God 
says do. to do. Amen. They made up their own idea that they wanted to run it off into the rocks. So they cut off the anchors and threw them in the sea. And then they lowered the rudders and raised the foresail and headed towards the shore. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon. Somebody say too soon. Too soon. If you move before God says to move, you will run aground every time. All right, man. Yeah. yeah. God said we were shipwrecked, but God didn't say you were going to shipwreck right here. He said you were going to shipwreck all the way over there. Uh -huh. But because you chose to do what you wanted to do and made your decision too soon. Somebody say too soon. Too soon. One thing that we have failed to do in, my, in this church for the last four years is pray to God enough before we make decisions. We have moved too soon on too many things. We have moved too soon on our own intellect. We have moved too soon on our own experiences without stopping to ask God, when do you want us to move? How do you want us to move? And where do you want us to go? And we're going to continue working. I didn't say stop. We're going to continue working where we are until you give us direction to go somewhere else. Right. Touch somebody else and say, don't go too soon. Don't go too soon. Don't go too soon. Don't go too soon. They did it too soon and they ran upon some rocks and the ship ran aground too soon which means that they were stuck in the middle of the sea and couldn't get to the shore the reason God told the apostle Paul that I'm going to shipwreck you on an island is because there was safety on the island I know that don't work together I'm being shipwrecked but there's safety listen God will carry you through some stuff. Did God cause that storm? No. Did God cause the winds? No. Did God make Paul get in prison? No. Did God make any of those things happen? No. But because Paul was in it, God strengthened Paul for the storm, even though he didn't stop the storm for Paul. Paul understood in the midst of the storm that I need to eat, I need to be sustained, I need to pray to God, because God may not calm the storm, but he will calm me down in the midst of the storm. Amen. They didn't make it to the shore. They were stuck on some rocks. The soldiers decided if we let any of these prisoners escape, the captain of the guard will kill us. So soldiers, brothers, let's kill all the prisoners so that none of them float away from this place. But there are some agents, some principalities, even some people in your life whose sole purpose is to kill you physically, mm. mentally, mm. spiritually, mm. and emotionally. Right, Every man. time they see you, they're making plans on how to kill you next. Uh -huh. What word they can say to make you look bad. What things they can say about you to make you feel bad. But listen, I'm going to tell you something. I, somebody one time said, look at you with your fat self. I said, look, hurt me with something that I already don't know. You can't hurt me with fat. I already know I'm fat. In fact, do you want to go get some chicken wings? Since I'm so fat. Look, you can't hurt me with some stuff that I know. So you can't call me a liar. God knows that he saved me from lying. You can't call me a cheat. God knows he saved me from being a cheat. When I'm comfortable with myself, even the people who try to kill me with words can't kill me. Because I know that I am a wretch. And that it had not been for God, I would be laid out in the midst of all of my troubles. But thank God he saved me. Thank God he raised me. Thank God he keeps on doing great things. Folks are trying to kill you. You may not even see it. But the enemy has designed schemes and put people and things in place to take the children of God out of here. And if you are not rooted and grounded in God's word and what God says about you, you will begin to believe what they say to you and apply it to your life. When they tell you you ain't going to be nothing, you're going to start walking around like you are nothing. But the thing is, if you tell me I ain't nothing, I'm going to say, you sure right. I ain't a doggone thing, but I serve a God who is everything to me. 
the prisoner said, let's kill all the soldiers. All, all, all the, the soldiers said, let's kill all the prisoners so they can't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to say, Paul, wait a minute, wait a minute. It didn't say the commanding officer wanted to save all of the prisoners, mother. It said he wanted to save Paul. Let me tell you something. Be careful and very careful of the anointing that God has on your life. Because your anointing or your failure to preserve your anointing affects more than just you. There are people around you that's trying to kill you, but watch this. There are also people around you for whatever reason who depend on your anointing. Uh -huh. They are close to you not to hurt you, but because they see God's favor on your life. They are close to you because they figure, God, I might not have what she got. I may not have been through and arrived where she is, but if I stick close enough to her, I know that you're working through her life, and I'm guaranteed that if I stick close enough to her, you're going to do something in my life too. There are people who are walking around the day alive because of your relationship with God. Can I prove it to you? Anybody ever had a mother pray for them? when you couldn't pray for yourself, when you couldn't get yourself together, when you was out running the streets and when you was out doing any and everything by yourself, your mother's anointing and relationship with God caused God to move on behalf of her tears, on behalf of her pleas, and God's heart was moved, not because you were good, but because she was anointed. Your anointing affects other people. And the captain found favor with Paul. Uh -huh. And because uh -huh. he found favor with Paul, let me back this all the way up. At the beginning of the chapter, they already said that he found favor with Paul. Paul tried to give them instructions to keep them from being shipwrecked. But the captain, the, the, the soldier decided to ignore Paul and do what the captain said. Now I can imagine that in his mind, the centurion is saying, wait a minute, if I'd have listened to Paul in the beginning, we wouldn't be where we are right now. We would have made it all the way to our destination without any trial, without any tribulation, without any turmoil. So even those who aren't saved and don't know God will look at you and see the wisdom in your life because of God's favor on your life. You don't have to go to your job with a big cross on your shirt, with a Bible strapped to your back, doing a dance down the aisle and waving hallelujah and whatnot, you just got to walk with the anointing around you because it may not be visible to those who don't need to see it but even those who don't know God can see that there's something about you yeah. so that when you're in meetings on your job they'll ask you how to get the job done when you go to situations on your job they'll ask you to lead the project they'll give you a raise that what nobody else is supposed to get they'll give you a rating that they say only those who walk on water can get a three rating but you end up getting a three every time simply because you found favor with God God, that means other people will find favor with you. All right now. Amen. He wanted to save Paul. And so this time around, when the soldiers wanted to kill everybody, he decided to listen to Paul. The commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let the soldiers carry out their plan. Then, watch this, he ordered everyone who could swim to jump overboard first and make their way for land. How many folk in here can swim? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you can swim. You said can, swim. Can. Oh. can. 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 How many folk can't swim? Stand up, all y'all who can't swim. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> oh, we gonna die. <laughs> Reverend. <laughs> Reverend. Need we help. gonna die. Need help. Oh Lord. I can't swim. Need help, brother. I don't I don't even want to get in the shower with it over my head for too long. Because I feel like I'm gonna die. I went to Jamaica, I was 18, went to Jamaica with a singing group. We went on mission tours to sing. I almost drowned in the pool. I ain't never wanted to get back in the pool. When I go to the YMCA, I get in that in that four feet, five feet, what I be doing it. I be flapping my feet around, I put them little weights on my arm, and I be, you know, doing stuff. 
kicking around, you put me in a hot tub, boy, you think I was Greg Luganus or somebody out there swimming, Michael Phelps, but I can all keep standing up, you non-swimming folks. Pick up your Bible. Stand up. Pick up your Bible. If you can't swim, pick up your Bible. Pick up your Bible. Come on. All these other folks, they done already made it to shore because they can swim. They lived by a creek or something when they were little and they had to swim. You know them kids. We go down by the creek and we went swimming and we went fishing and the rest of us is in the city somewhere and we ain't going no swimming. The rest of y'all going to die. Look at the person next to you standing up with a Bible. Tell them you get ready to die. Tell them. Tell somebody else. You're getting ready to die. You won't die. Unless, you come on, die. unless you hold on to that little piece of the ship. Tell them again. You're getting ready to die. Unless you hold on to that little piece of the ship. Because after those who could swim jumped off and began to swim, the ship began to break up into pieces. And what the soldier told everybody is, everybody else, grab hold to a piece yeah. of the ship. Yeah. Because just yeah. like the ship could float, yeah. those pieces could float. Oh, y'all not hearing me today. Some of us are so concerned with the state of the ship that we forget that God has given us a piece. Hold your Bibles up in the air. If you could just put your word of God up underneath you and hide it in your heart. I don't care what water she go through. I don't care what trouble she go through. I don't care what situation she go through. You can live on broken pieces. There you go. The word of God is there to sustain us. And watch this. When the rest of y'all, come on all you swimming folks, you stand up too. When the rest of y'all see us coming to shore, don't look mad at us, but y'all ought to be praising God because you see the word coming through. You see the rest of God's people coming through. God has sustained us. God has kept us. God has strengthened us to live on broken pieces. Your faith may not be where it needs to be and sometimes it's broken. Somebody say, I'm living on broken pieces. My heart has been torn asunder and I don't know how it's going to be him, but God entered into my heart and now I'm living on broken pieces. My mind gets confused sometimes and I get tired and I get sad and I just want to quit, but I'm living on broken pieces. Friends have forsaken me and turned their back on me and I seem like I'm all by myself, but I'm living on broken pieces. I thank God mm. for the broken pieces. Come here, Reverend Hatcher. I'm going to tell a, tell a truth here. Reverend Hatcher make the best lemon cake. Yes. Oh, yes I believe yes. that when Martha was in the kitchen cooking and Mary was out there ministering to Jesus, if Martha had been cooking Michelle's lemon cake, that Jesus would have left that foot washing and gone in the kitchen and got him a piece of cake. But I'm going to tell you something about the cake. Sometimes Reverend Hatcher will take a cake to a church function and a platter that she needs back. And sometimes they'll send it back with maybe one or two pieces of cake in it. But I'm going to tell you something that she know that the rest of y'all may not know. Those big pieces of cake ain't where all the goodness is. (laughs) It's those crumbs in the bottom of the pan. Yeah, because if you take these two two fingers right here, all of that lemon icing that dropped to the bottom of the pan, all of the crunchy bits have fallen to the bottom of the pan, and you just sweep up a couple other pieces. Because the same stuff that's in the big cake is in the broken pieces. So I don't mind if I get a broken piece here or there because I know it has the same substance that's in the big piece. So we might be living on broken pieces right now. But God is sustaining us. God is keeping us. You go to your house with confidence that God has you covered. Will you go through some storms? Yes, you will. And watch this. There may be some storms that you don't make it out of. But I believe that the God I serve, Uh even if he don't do it for me, he's able. Somebody say he's able. He's able to calm the storm. 
He's able to make a way out of no way. And he's able to enable you to live on broken pieces. Come on, somebody give God praise for the broken pieces. Come on, don't do it for me. Do it for God. Give God praise. Thank you, Lord. For the broken pieces.